Okay, Mark Miller, thanks so much for coming on my podcast. Hey, Todd, thanks so much for having me. Okay, so you have written a lot about predictive processing. I've read a lot of your papers. I, I think they're incredibly interesting. You've written about play. That's a subject that I'm really interested in. Yep, that's uh, you, 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 you write about uh, perception and action and, and psychopathology and how predictive processing can help us understand what it means to live a good life. So yeah. tell us, uh, introduce us to what you're doing right now, the organization that you're in and how, what's your background? How did you get into this? Yeah, nice. Um, I just started a new gig, actually. I'm now being, uh, I'm based at Monash University in Australia, in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm part of a really exciting new lab there headed by Jakob Hui um, called the Center for Consciousness and Contemplative Studies. And it's just a department that's bringing together this sort of massively interdisciplinary team to be looking specifically at the science of well-being, the science of meditation. So that's been really great. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, Jakob Hui is one of the big people in predictive processing um, research today. Yeah. You know, him and Carl Furston and um, Andy Clark are sort of the big names in that field. And while the lab isn't sort of a predictive processing lab, there are some there's some really key members there that are doing predictive processing, active inference sort of research. So um, I fit in. I fit in very well. So it, it is your training in uh, f more philosophy or, or, or science? Or I mean, I guess that's what I find interesting about predictive processing a little bit is that you've got the scientists talking to the philosophers in a, in a productive way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. So um, I did my undergraduate in uh, philosophy. And then I went on to do um, sort of an interdisciplinary cognitive science master's. And then I did a PhD technically in philosophy at the University of Edinburgh, but I, was, I did my PhD with Andy Clark. And uh, if you know Andy Clark's work, then you know um, it's really challenging to know where to locate him along the spectrum between philosopher and cognitive scientist. Um, you know, he's written sort of paradigm changing cognitive science textbooks. Um, but he was like, you know, his first sort of educational degree was in French literature. So, I mean, like he, he, again, I mean, came at this from the side and has just done incredible things in the cognitive science community. So I don't know where I fit anymore, actually, Todd. Um, I, uh, I, I'm somewhere between a philosopher and cognitive scientist. So I follow Andy. I say, I'm a philosopher of cognitive science or a philosopher of cognition. Okay. So yeah. the, the distinction between philosophy and science, I mean, you can kind of, obviously we know it's blurry because that's just what you said. Do you see any usefulness to the, the distinction at all? I mean, other than it can identify what, what building someone be, would be working in. <laughs> or, or, I mean, I mean, certainly there's some things that are obviously philosophy yeah, and yeah. some things that are obviously science. Yeah. But uh, other than that, do you think about that distinction or have some kind of way to sum it up or? Yeah, it's a super good question. Um, first, I kind of think, and I kind of hope that, you know, like we start spending time in the same buildings more and more. Actually, the departments that I've been a part of that I think were the, the most innovative, uh, the departments that were most in touch um, with sort of relevant current research have been those departments where you have lots of um, the neighboring disciplines hanging out in the sort of same space. So University of Edinburgh is like that. They have a PPLS, which is philosophy, psychology, and language sciences, and they all share a building. So you have anthropologists and cognitive scientists and neuroscientists, all sort of, and philosophers all sort of in the same building. Um, right, so yeah, um, I guess the big difference is, you know, how much time you're spending just doing theory, you know? Um, at one end of that graded scale, you have really theory heavy researchers who aren't spending time in labs. They're not devising experiments. They're not really necessarily working on research teams. And yeah. then at the other end, you have really practical science being done, um, but not a lot of time necessarily thinking about frameworks. That's what I think the nice role for philosophers today is on these teams is, um, for instance, myself, um, the, the role that I tend to play on a team with scientists is um, I read the literature at the various neighboring fields around a topic, and then I'm making framework hypotheses about how that data fits together. And from those frameworks, we're devising, you know, new experiments to see whether or not that's a good way to go. And I think that's cool, you know, because as a scientist, you're not necessarily trained um, in doing a sort of 
broad literature review and then making a best guess about the way in which research should go. Um, so it's cool to have somebody on the team who specializes in that, who specializes in reading critically and making best guesses. And then, um, then of course, it's up for the empirical science to see whether or not it's a good guess or a bad guess at the end of the day. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. And, so, and so, you know, the predictive processing, not only getting the, the scientists together with the philosophers, but but I, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's seemingly getting uh, philosophers who, from kind of different schools of thought, maybe, maybe uh, in, into the same tent as well, yeah. you know, the more the kind of radical embodied people, and then the yeah. more, uh, you know, kind of computational approaches, do, do, does that, do they kind of fit together under the predictive processing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what you get what you get from the predictive processing active inference um, hypothesis is you get a new way of thinking about a cognitive architecture, like what what is going on um, in thinking, and it is cool for a lot of researchers. It's really interesting for a lot of researchers because, well, because it's so widely applicable. Um, the framework itself looks like it's inclusive of not only what it means to think, but it has this really sort of sexy way of accounting for how thinking and feeling and perceiving and acting and imagining and hallucinating um, and, and uh, all of that uh, sort of hangs together in a really elegant sort of beautiful framework. So if you're interested in, if you're interested in any of that, and I think you can imagine like lots of people are interested in that sort of milieu of topics, then this new cognitive framework might be an interesting way to start rethinking some of the research that you've been interested in. Yeah, so you've got a grand unified theory. You're going to explain perception and action and belief and desire and even even like how we regulate our temperature and our hunger and pain and everything in terms of basically what prediction error minimization. So can right. you give us like a real simple, high-level explanation of why prediction error minimization, according to some model, can like ex explain all these things. Maybe you can talk about the difference between perceptive inference and active inference, because the perceptive inference, to me, that's pretty intuitive. People understand that. The active inference is where you go, whoa, that's, that's, a, that's a new interesting thing to, to my intuition. So t tell me about the yeah. difference between perceptive inference and active inference. Yeah, so... Um... Right. Is it interesting maybe just to take one step back from there and just say, like just in broad strokes, the sort of revolutionary idea here is that rather than thinking about perceptual processing, rather than thinking about neural processing really as largely um, a bottom up affair. I mean, that's a little bit, that's a little bit of a straw man, because of course, we've known for a long time that the brain processes up and down, right. But we did have an idea that perception was largely a sort of like primarily a bottom up sort of feature detection and then the brain fills out you know so you light light bounces off an object in the world and it hits the sensory apparatus and then the brain starts interpreting that light um, you know those patterns in increasingly sophisticated ways and again that's that's not exactly true because we have known there was bidirectionality for a long time but that was the that was the largely what we thought and this new framework um, in essence, flips that over, and we start we start highlighting more the the top down processing rather than just the bottom up processing, and the result is that you get a you get a sort of new picture of the way that the brain and the cognitive architecture works, such that um, rather than waiting around passively for information that then the system goes about um, interpreting, uh, the system is actually it's way more efficient for a system just to take what it already knows about the causal, um, the causal relationship between things in the world. So it, it, what we already know about how the world works and make a sort of best guess about what's gonna happen next. And then just use the difference between our guess and what actually happens as a learning signal to improve our predictions or to move in the world in a way that gets us a better predictive grip. So right there is where we're going to see this difference between perceptual inference and active inference. And just, do you want to, 
jump in there before? I, I have this metaphor that I've been using to understand yeah. this a little bit and also the difference between perceptive, uh, to understand perceptive inference and also the difference with active. So if, I, if I'm a CEO of a, of a corporation with a massive amount of activities and, and I want to control those activities and understand what they're, what they're going on, it's not efficient for me to process every bit of little bit of information that's flowing upwards through the chain from all the from all the, the the lower workers to the managers to the vice presidents i could just say to like what to two of my most trusted assistants i'm expecting i'm predicting that we're going to sell you know 100 units of xyz next month and you know, let me know if uh, if that's on going right or not, and then and then you and then if you hear nothing, you just assume that you're getting a hundred units of everything. Yeah. It's kind of it, and, and so you only hear about the things that you really, really need to hear about way at the top of the chain, because this is like a hierarchical thing too. Yeah, that's something we run into quite a lot. Um, you know, you're always going to have error in the system. You're always going to have some discrepancy between what the system expects the world to be like and what the world is actually like. Um, so you're right, a really key player here to pay attention to, especially if you're going to start thinking about things like playfulness and curiosity and uh, psychopathology and things like happiness and well-being. That's all going to hang really on which errors are newsworthy. That's going to be a really important discussion to have because not everything is newsworthy. Not all of the prediction errors are newsworthy. Only some prediction errors, only the prediction errors that matter. And then that's a whole discussion about what prediction errors actually matter to an organism as it's trying to survive in a particular niche. Um, I might just add quickly that, because you asked me about it, about the difference between perceptual inference and active inference. Yeah, yeah. Um, super quick. It's just that you can just imagine that given this framework, um, humans and actually all animals, and if you push it, maybe all life is working under this, um, is working along these lines of making a best prediction about how the world is. We'd have to think about what a prediction is because it's not necessarily an agent level like, oh, I have a prediction, but rather the system expects some uh, things to be the case. Um, and the reduction of the difference between those expectations and what actually happens. And there's two ways that you can get a good, uh, this sort of good predictive grip on your environment. Well, you can either update the model or to better fit the world, so you know you have an expectation that it's going to be one way. It turns out not to be that way. You could just update your model. So now you go, oh, no, it's actually like that. Or uh, sometimes it's easier just to change the world to make the world better fit your model. So then you don't have any model updating. You just act on the world in order to bring it into closer alignment with the way that you expect things to be. It doesn't matter which one you do. Either way, you're reducing that discrepancy. And that's, uh, according to the framework, that's the modus operandi of the system, is just to reduce that disparity between the prediction and what's actually going on. And you can either do that by updating the model, or you can do that by acting and updating the world. And uh, it's cool to see that we've got the same maths expressing, uh, expressing what a perception is and what an action is, and it's exactly the same sorts of maths. It's just prediction error minimization. Yeah, so it's always all about predictive error minimization, and sometimes you minimize the error by changing your ideas of the world, and sometimes right. you do it by changing the world. Right. And this could even explain how we regulate our temperature, how we regulate our hunger. It's because we have predictions that are, you know, maybe predictions in big scare quotes, right, or expectations. Predictions, yep. not conscious predictions, but we have yep. these uh, innately endowed predictions right. that we're going to get fed every so often, that the That's body right. will be at a certain temperature. That's and right. when those predictions are violated and we're getting the error, we act to correct right. it. Exactly right. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And so you've got the idea that part of what gives you, uh, what makes you feel good is to minimize prediction error, right? And that's, that's why you have a certain mood. That's why you have a certain emotion. Yeah. So that's been, that's been a, a sort of um, hallmark of our work for the last five years. Uh, me and Julian Kiverstein and Eric Reitfeld and Andy Clark and a, a number of other researchers. We've been especially interested in how, um, how feeling states are explained using this framework. That was my first research that I was interested in is what are emotions, how are emotions how are cognitions and emotions and perceptions related to one another? Are they really separate categories? Are they dynamically entangled? If they're entangled, how are they entangled? Um, 
And uh, so we've been using the predictive processing framework to think through some of these um, puzzles about what a feeling state is. And um, you're right. So just to give you, I'll just give you a quick little bit of history there. So yeah. our first, our first crack at thinking about feelings was that they were really similar to the way that we perceived the world. So interception turned out to be really similar to what extraception was. So in the same way as I make a prediction about the world and then I show up and the signals and the prediction together, they get crunched and then I have some experience of the outside world, then what feelings were were the exact same thing. They were the brain's best guess about certain signals coming in from the body. And somehow those the, the feelings from the body, signals from the body, plus the predictions, plus the context get crunched. And then we have a kind of feeling state. And actually that's still great. I mean, I think that's a really um, important part of the story. What we've been interested in though, is that feelings also look like they turn out to be not only the result of top-down predictions about the body, but rather as a kind of second order information that informs the system about how well it's predicting over time relative to its expectations. So it's not just predictions about our body that are manifesting as feelings, but um, it's a kind of training or learning signal that's telling us like our good feelings and our bad feelings. I mean, really rough cut there, right? We're not talking about happiness and sadness and fear necessarily, We're talking more about the building blocks of feeling like valence and arousal, that that's tracking um, how well you're doing at this predictive game that you're engaged in. And if you tend to do better than expected, you have some expectation for how it's gonna go and you do better, it feels super good. That's what makes us feel excited. It's what tracks um, our interest. It makes something super salient. It magnetizes us to it. And when we do worse than expected, it does the exact opposite. It should repel us. It should uh, make us task switch or turn away or forge for a different way of gripping in that scene. So you're, so we're always, we're always experiencing constantly, uh, there's constantly errors, there's constantly prediction errors. And if there wasn't, then there wouldn't constantly be actions, right? I mean, every, That's right. every second of my life, as I sit here, there's some sort of error. There's some sort of like, I right. thought my stomach would be a little bit more full right now. Uh, I thought right. that, uh, you know, I'm a little bit confused by what Mark just said. I need to, to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need to get my mind going a little bit faster. And, and, and so yeah. that's what, what keeps us going. Yeah. And there's a certain, there's a certain rate at which that's happening. And, and, and that helps determine our, our mood, right? So if we, if these things are coming at us really, really quick, oh my God, there's a huge error. I totally didn't understand what Mark just said, or I'm getting really cold right now. Yep. Then we're going to start to feel something and it's going to be kind of negatively or positively valence to turn based on right. deg degree of error, right? Right, right, exactly. So locally, you're going to get little shifts in affect depending on how well or poorly you're doing at getting your predictive grip on the scene. So, you know, you, uh, you know, you love coffee and then you wake up and you realize that like your favorite cafe has just opened a new branch right across from your house. It's very attractive, sort of very inspiring in that moment, you know, because it's very quick. It's quick. It's a lot quicker than it used to be. It's right there. So that kind of feels good. You know, we've just reduced the amount of volatility that we normally have to digest in order to get our good cup of coffee, it's right there. Um, and, uh, and the other way too, you know, locally you, you fail to, let's say you're playing a musical instrument and it's, I mean, you know, I just started trying to play the fiddle, the violin, and it's super hard as an adult. It's really embarrassing as an adult because you make really terrible noises, you know? So it takes, I think it takes adults a lot longer. I think kids don't care about making all sorts of bad noises. So I think they can like get through that part faster. But for me, the kind of error I'm generating as I'm making these awful noises, uh, it fills me with a lot of negative valence and that negative valence gets me to sort of task switch away from, from, the, from the event, from that uh, engagement. So that's feelings locally. Moods then, which are a little more global, a little more general, a little bit more long lasting, you know? So you can have, like if you go to your therapist and your therapist says, uh, how are you doing? They're not specifically asking how you did at some particular local engagement. Like it would be weird to say, hey Todd, how's it going? And you say, well, 
I couldn't play my guitar very well today. I mean, that maybe that would be an answer, but it'd be a kind, kind of, of itchy right here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's pretty local. <laughs> I'm not really asking you about your local engagement here. I'm asking about a global Something engagement. Broader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you doing overall? And yeah. this is our recent work has been looking a lot at this is thinking about the predictive dynamics of these global estimations. So if you have lots of little successes, then you get a sort of lift in your global expectation to be doing well. And if you get a couple of failures, you get a sort of global depression of how well you're doing. And actually both of those are really important, you know, um, evolutionarily speaking. So for instance, one of the reasons why we might have moods like this is because rewards tend to come clustered. So in nature, um, if you find one berry on a bush, maybe it's because it's springtime, you know, you have a sort of upswing of berry creating potential. So if you find one berry, it should lift your expectation for rewards in a more general way, because that's going to make you expect more rewards, which is going to tune your system to be looking for rewards. And then you tend to get more berry eating opportunities because you're on the lookout. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but that should only go on for so long until you're doing worse than expected. And then you should not put so much power into berry foraging because either the bush is going to eventually empty or the season, of course, can change. So this sort of natural upswing and downswing of our expectations for how well we should do in our predictive tasks, there should be a really sort of, I suspect there should be a natural cosine that keeps us in touch with how rewards actually are in the environment. And actually a lot of our work on pathology has been about how exactly that mechanism can get, um, can get a little bit messed up. Yeah, so your work on uh, psychopathologies in, in, in terms of this predictive processing uh, idea that, so, you know, since this is such a grand unifying theory, we can think of all of these psychopathologies, whether it's depression or anxiety or schizophrenia or different things as being kind of a, what is it? It's kind of having like a, a bad model of the world that's not very good at minimizing prediction error Right. Over, t over right. long periods of time. And right. isn't that right? Right. Dead on. Dead on. Exactly right. Right. So we did work on a ton of different pathologies. So depression and anxiety and OCD and depersonalization and uh, trauma and PTSD. And um, we started to notice that there was a shared quality uh, between them all. And that quality was exactly like you say, that there's some bad belief that's been installed, something that's suboptimal or non-adaptive, and it's ceasing to be updated. That's the really special thing that we are, that we're tracking right now, is that it's the stickiness of these beliefs. It's not necessarily that you have a maladaptive belief installed, you know, because that probably it, it might happens. be very adaptive. It might be very adapted for a local time and place. Like, let's right. say, you get to, you get physically beaten up and someone traumatizes you and now you have the belief that god damn people are dangerous right uh, that might be a fantastic right. belief wh while you remain in this particular context it becomes maladaptive if it's sticky as applied to other contexts because then you're not uh, hanging out with people dead on just perfectly said exactly right uh, locally that belief network makes sense and actually if the brain really is this kind of prediction optimizing machine, then it's always trying to get a good grip on the world. So it really is trying to update itself in optimal ways. It can just be led astray in a couple of ways. And one of those is exactly like you say, you know, you have uh, trauma and then you install some beliefs that work locally, um, but then they get stuck. That's what we're interested in is why do they get stuck in a way where they then come from niche to niche to niche, even when they stop being appropriate. Like for instance, in depression as well, you know, like um, once depression is sort of kicked in, then you tend to ignore rewarding opportunities and you turn the volume up on um, confirmation of depression. And that's one of, the, it's one of the nasty things that happens with this kind of cognitive framework. There's all these really nasty, self-fulfilling prophecy things and for both ways. Bad, like bad, you, feed, bad feedback loops. But also positive, right? Like um, this is why doing things like a gratitude journal is so potent Basically, what you're doing is you're, you're telling yourself once a day, remember reasons why you're fortunate. And so the system starts predicting that you're fortunate. And then it tries to confirm that by orienting your gaze in the world 
to, yeah. to confirm that prediction that the world is a good place. And then you confirm it and it solidifies the belief, which keeps you on the lookout, which confirms it, which solidifies the belief. And that can be a really positive, beautiful cycle to be in. Um, but you can get washed right out the other way too, which is for whatever reason you start to expect it. It's hopeless. That's especially, I think that's the especially vicious one. You start to think no matter what I do, I can't get a good grip on this scene. Uh, and that can happen for a couple of reasons, right? Like those really like really hardwired things that can happen. Like you are not fed, you don't sleep, you have no shelter, you have no medicine. I mean, if you have that persistently, then the system begins to think it doesn't matter what I do. I can't get a good grip on those bio on those bioregulatory expectations, like you were saying, like temperature and blood sugar level. And I can't seem to get there. Um, but it can happen for other reasons too, like abuse, long-term pain. Maybe we can come back to that. Like chronic pain is a big one. No matter where you task switch, you're in pain. So the system starts to implement a high level belief system that says, uh, this is not working. This is no bueno. Uh, no matter what you do, it doesn't seem like you can get a good grip on the scene. As yeah. soon as that high level belief gets installed, that nasty feedback starts where now that's a belief. And what the system does is it tries to confirm it. And when it confirms it, it solidifies it and yeah. sort of a, uh, and around and around you go. Yeah. Cause you can reduce your prediction error, which is ultimately what you want to do by changing your beliefs or changing the world. And when it's uh, you know, changing your beliefs, that's, uh, that's kind of painful, right? That's cognitive dissonance. We don't want to do that. Uh, so if you're kind of avoiding the pain of changing your beliefs, it might be easier to just change the world. Let's say your belief is that everybody is dangerous. Everybody is, uh, is out to get me. You could just kind of uh, confirm your bias by avoiding people. When people start to be nice, you could got to, got to interpret it and give it a crummy interpretation and say, oh, that was just in their self-interest or or just kind of leave the scene, just kind of run away from, from that nice person, because that would, that would keep you within this, that you wouldn't have to update your belief system, which is painful. Exactly right. And even, even a little bit more vicious than that, you might surround yourself with violent people, pick violent partners, get back again and again into the violent situation that you highly expect to be in. The system expects to be in a certain amount of danger. It's now taken that as its set level. And now it's trying to create a world that matches its predictions of the world. So you can see where a, an optimizing system can go, yeah. can go off the tracks and start optimizing over the wrong belief set. And like, over, the wrong, over the wrong time set. So this is a good short-term strategy. It's a crappy long-term strategy. Indeed. Uh, and so that reminds me of your work with drugs too, which is also a very good short-term strategy to minimize prediction area. If I, if I take cocaine, I can pretty accurately predict how I'm going to feel for the next, uh, uh, 24 hours, but my life in general might become very hard to predict <laughs> for long periods of time, right? Absolutely. And actually, you know, like drugs, drugs are um, a really good example of something that can bend our predictive model in one of these sort of maladaptive ways. Because so for instance, like opioids, uh, anything that's really pumping the reward system in a strong way. Um, if you look at that through the lens of predictive processing, what it's doing in effect is it's just it's adjusting the precision on your predictions and your prediction errors so precision here is just the trustworthiness or reliability of those signals so um, all the time the system is also paying attention to uh, how reliable its predictions are as it starts making them and tests them against the world um, and drugs that are highly addictive the reason why they're addictive is because they are toggling precision sort of directly. So uh, if that's the case, then the drug seeking and taking behaviors will get their volumes turned way up because it sort of feels to the system. This is the other sort of vicious bit. It feels to the system like it's suddenly doing way better than expected at reducing error relative to all of your cares and concerns. So when you take heroin, the reason why it's so powerful for us is because it's impacting the brain as if all of those predictive tasks that you were trying to accomplish to have a good life, suddenly they all went really good, super good. You can imagine why that's so dangerous for us, especially if you are in the kind of case where you're not getting a good predictive grip, you're hungry, you have no home, 
you're underfed, you're underslept, you have a lot of emotional stress. Those are all examples where you're having a really hard time managing the prediction error in your life. And then suddenly something happens and that's the drug seeking and taking behaviors. And suddenly it feels like you get a, like the best predictive grip you've ever gotten on everything you care about. Um, no wonder the system goes haywire for it. No wonder it turns the volume way up on those opportunities and starts turning the volume way down on all of the little neighboring opportunities because nothing reduces error that well in the world. Yeah. So we have to tolerate the uh, the surprise that, you know, the types of, there's certain types of surprise which is, should cause us to update our models of the world, update our kind of action policies and strategies, but we need to be able to tolerate kind of the pain and the uncertainty and the surprise uh, in the short term to be able yeah. to make things better in the long term, right? I mean, yeah. this kind of helps explain what the good life is. It's the kind of life that is constantly encountering the right level of surprise to keep us, you know, on our toes, right? Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Well said again. Um, so, right. So I do, let me add something just to your point there. Uh, we got interested, we're especially interested right now in drugs of addiction because, um, like I said, we were interested in what good feelings and bad feelings were. And when you start thinking about what is a good life and you think, well, it's about feeling good or it's about being happy. If you have anything like that in play, which isn't, which isn't obvious that that should necessarily be what we think of as a good life, but it certainly must play some role in living a good life that you feel good. Um, drugs of addiction are a really good foil for that idea right? Because now you feel super good, but you have a garbage life. Like I'm talking long-term addiction, right? Like it feels good locally. Locally, you're getting all the feedback as if things are going really well, but uh -huh. globally they're falling apart. And so that was an interesting test case to start thinking about, well, okay, well, it can't just be the feelings then. Um, part of the solution there is that although it tells the system that it's doing better than expected, the system's actually not doing better than expected. It's not like you've just gotten a better job or developed some new relationship skills or had like a breakthrough with your therapist or got, you know, whatever in the world. That's the other way that you can pump those same systems. Um, none of that has happened, which is what would make you a better volatility managing system over the long term. Rather, you just get the feeling. So that's the one problem with that. But the other thing is exactly what you just said. It's only happening locally, but nothing is changing globally. And in fact, at the global level, we're losing our predictive grip with all sorts of things on the, on the longer time horizon. Like our health may be deteriorating. We might start ignoring our relationships, our long-term social relationships. Whereas if you, do, if you keep those up, then they last a really long time and they support you for a really long time. You know, um, Those things might start actually breaking down at the periphery. Um, so now what you're doing is you're basically giving up your global, your global error minimizing opportunities for these local sugary sort of uh, high, high calorie, but no substance error reducing opportunities. Yeah. You're, you're living in a kind of a fantasy fantasy world. That's going to collide with the real world and generate some really big errors. At some point. And then of course, and then you see why that's a feedback, right? Because you're losing yeah. touch with all of these important error minimizing things you normally take care of. And as they start deteriorating, of course, the errors are going to go up. Um, so now when you sober up, of course, you're being met by a huge amount of new volatility and the system goes to what it knows works well for local reductions. So you're right. Like one of the things that we're interested in, in terms of long-term well-being, will be how do we, what does it mean for this sort of system to be able to, uh, yeah, to be able to digest certain local errors um, when it means like to confront and engage with and experience local volatility in ways that allow us to have global, a better global predictive grip. What does that look like computationally? How can we model it and how can we understand it? And then uh, what, what does it look like in terms of practices that can actually help you uh, deal with these psychopathologies? So, I mean, the traditional practices are contemplative practices, therapeutic practices, and you can understand why those work in terms of your model, right? Yeah, that, that's the kind of cool stuff we're onto now. Um, we're just at the very edge of it. Um, 
uh, but it's the stuff I'm most, I'm most excited about. And yeah, so a couple of things. Um, well, you mentioned one, a gratitude journal. Oh, yeah, God, that's, and like for anybody who's listening today, so I'm a long-term meditator and long-term meditation teacher as well. And, um, you know, early on in my meditation career, I was really passionate about the really deep attention and awareness training programs, you know, really hardcore teaching attention to be really exclusive, um, doing long-term retreats. And um, that's all good stuff. But I'll tell you, after kind of 20 years of practice, looking back now, I think the most the most powerful practice I, I know is a gratitude practice. It's the most transformative practice I know. I mean, it's it's not like some little side practice. It's like a it's like the practice, you know, like if you can, and here's why, you know, and I mean, I've already said it, but like, it's, I want to say it twice, you know, that's how important it is. We should say it twice. If you focus on the things that are working and at first that feels really weird. One of the reasons why it might feel really weird is because it's exactly antithetical to some of the belief structures you have in play. That's a good sign. Um, of course, if you're in a situation where things really aren't working well, then, you know, we're not talking about putting on rose tinted glasses or not, or not working through the things you're working on, but starting to jeopardize some of those strong beliefs that nothing is going right is so valuable for us. And it can start very small. And as soon as the system catches it, it takes on a life of its own. And I mean, we have some good evidence that even, you know, even people with major depression can really benefit from this. So there was a study done. So I sometimes say this, so I, I hope I haven't shared this too many times in these sort of spaces, but I think it's too cool to pass up. They did a, they did a study where they took people with really serious long-term depression and um, they gave them beepers and they beeped them randomly. And they asked them to, to write down what mood they were in and what they were thinking about and everything else, right? And before the study, they asked them, well, how often are you depressed? And they would say, we're depressed all the time. You know, I wake up depressed, I live depressed, I fall asleep depressed. I'm literally in pain. I, I, I'm always in pain. Like, what, what is this question? Like, I'm here at the hospital, like I'm, I'm, I'm in crisis and I'm always in crisis. And when they actually beeped them, they found that, you know, 80, 85, 90% of the time they weren't that it was only 10, 12, 15, I mean, only 15% of the time is a huge amount of time to feel like you're in crisis. So not downplaying that. But the fact was lots of good stuff was happening too, but it wasn't being picked up by the system. It was like the system was largely ignoring the neutral and positive things that were happening and continuing to construct this reality. That's one of the take home messages I think that I find so powerful by thinking, by considering seriously this framework is that the world you live in is being created in part from the top down based on your beliefs. So if you have some bad beliefs, that's you, you could be really living in a really different world than if you had some, some other beliefs, if you had some different beliefs. So something like gratitude is huge. That positive yeah. feedback is massive. Yeah, so I mean, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to perceive stuff uh, in accordance with your model. And if your model is kind of stitched together from three crummy... Uh, pixels, you've got this horrible picture of the world and there's just, you know, you're just focusing all of your attention on the pixels that support this bad image and you're ignoring all of the pixels that are kind of, could might show you something different, uh, then the solution is simply to turn your attention to that good stuff. And, you know, and it, that, that uh, practice of kind of writing down how you feel, that strikes me as just kind of like a longer term mindfulness, right? I mean, isn't that kind of what you're doing with mindfulness is just checking in on, on what's actually there you know, partly for the purpose of model updating. I mean, it seems like when you practice mindfulness, you're taking away the action. Are you are you biasing yourself in favor of perceptive inference and away from active inference and model updating when when you just sit there? Is that is that part of how that works? Yeah, it's super good. I just want to take one step back to something you said first before your second thing. Uh, mindfulness and its impact on this. I think you are exactly right. It seems like two good things come out of come out of contemplative training programs like mindfulness for getting us unstuck from these bad belief networks. One is it's super important to have a metacognitive layer start to have some potency where we are aware of the kinds of beliefs that we're having. Um, we all have metacognitive capabilities. I mean, that's just part of being a human, but I think we can underuse them. So uh, building up those skills, like exercising those muscles of knowing how you're feeling, knowing what you're thinking, 
And, you know, if you can't do it for yourself here, I mean, this is what therapy is for, right? A therapist becomes like a metacognitive layer, an externalized metacognitive layer of your system. What they're meant, they're, they're trained to do is to sit back as awareness and you say all sorts of local things. And then they say, hey, wait a second. You said this, and then you said this, you know, you said you kind of hate this thing. And then you told me you love this thing. Like, can we get those two together? Can you reconcile that for me in some way? So one thing is to get that metacognitive ability up and running where you know more about what you believe, you know more about why you're acting or why you're perceiving or how you're acting or how you're perceiving. That's a really important part about getting unstuck. And then the second thing is, is once you have a metacognitive uh, insight into where you're stuck or where there might be sort of old outdated ways of being or believing or acting, then finding ways to jeopardize that belief structure or jeopardize that behavior um, driving system in some way. And a context is king here. So there's no one easy way to do that. But finding where you have a bad belief network or where you have a belief network that doesn't fit your current niche and then getting counter evidence. So like you say, like if you realize that you have a sort of pessimistic attitude, um, you know, you're listening today and that's you, you know, what you might do is you might think, well, start actually watching your life a little more closely, see whether it's the case. Um, and if you start to feel a little bit suspicious that that belief might be outdated, might be an old belief that you picked up, you know, years ago and it's just playing itself out now, then once it's identified, the second step is to start jeopardizing it find ways that you can start amassing evidence that's counter to it um, to see if you can loosen it up a bit. Yeah, I like that. Be aware of as much good news as possible with, uh, with uh, you know, my, my people who are listening, who are interested in how this might apply to pain. I, I've, I've sometimes say that uh, you want to give your, give yourself as much good news as possible about your body. Go do an exercise where you, uh, where you go, hey, I just stretched further than I thought I could stretch. I lifted more than I thought I could lift. I ran further than I thought I could run. Those are all good things to change your kind of self-image and self-perception. And you might viscerally feel stronger in your body and maybe even you'll feel less pain. But the, but there is something about pain that I want to mention is that the, our, you know, our, if, if all perception is ultimately dictated by some model of the body or some belief, you can't just really, there's some beliefs about the body or some, per, some predictions that you just can't change, right? So if I had right. a, a knife in my back uh, and there's prediction errors as a result of the knife in my back, I couldn't just resolve that very well by saying, ah, so there's a knife in my back. I've no. my model, <laughs> now there's a knife in my back. So now I'm not having any prediction error because in some sense, I can't help but predict that my no, body's no. going to have some right. integrity, that's right? right? That's it. That's, that's right. in there. I'm not going to get right. rid of that. That's right. Uh, scare quotes prediction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I get that a lot. So this is uh, an, a really important point for everybody who's interested in this framework to to keep in mind. When we say prediction, we don't necessarily mean agent level prediction. We don't mean what you taught or me, Mark. It's actually, like I predict that the, the Giants are going to win the Super Bowl. It's no. <laughs> no. no. Because you have layers of prediction, your predictive model generating thing, it's layered. And so there are going to be deep layers that are just about the body's expectations for its own integrity. So in a way, we talk about the body having beliefs. They're not beliefs like we have beliefs, not agent level beliefs, but the body has certain expectations for what it means to be whole and healthy and functioning. And even those cell, regular, even a, even a cell has a prediction of course. that it's not going to get, that its, its membrane will stay there. Right. Where all the all we mean by prediction here is just that there is um, the state in which it stays alive is highly probable. It has to be highly probable, otherwise it wouldn't be here. So the 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 whole state of the cell is a highly probable state for the cell. So things that are non less probable, they're the ones that the cell wants to try to avoid. Um, right. So about the knife in your back. Right. <laughs> so you're right. These are super old, super old belief structures that are incredibly difficult to update. Um, so what we're not saying here is just, oh, well, I've updated my model. I know I'm in pain. So why doesn't the pain go away? Um, you know, I now know I'm going to be in pain. I've had pain for years. So obviously I predict that I'm going to be in pain and yet I'm still suffering the pain. And the reason there is, is because even though the agent has now learned that these signals are regular signals that they encounter, 
um, the body isn't able to update some of those very easily. Now, can it be updated at all? I'm not sure. Like we have some pretty weird ascetic traditions on earth where humans have shown that they can do some pretty remarkable things in reinterpreting signals. So you have lots of Buddhist monks, for instance, who uh, bring about their own end of life process, you know, starve themselves to death, self-immolate, um, and they're capable of doing that. That seems like basically impossible, I think, for most of us. Um, but they've updated their experience of errors coming from their body to such a high degree that those errors no longer drive actions like saying ow or pulling away or, or backing up, which is what for most of us happen. So, I mean, what does that have to do with us? I mean, maybe the one thing that we can take from those extreme cases um, is maybe a clue for why mindfulness-based pain reduction works. Because what you're doing there is you're not necessarily getting out of the, of the pain signal itself, but rather you're turning in and you're beginning to set the intention to better model what pain is all about. You know, you start asking yourself, well, what is, what is this signal that's trying to drive my behaviors in some way in order to help reduce that pain? What if you, what if you cut that off at its source and stop trying, stop allowing it to drive actions to try to make the world or the body feel differently? But what if you sat, that's one of the powerful things about sitting in meditation is you cut off that active element. And now you're just gonna look right at the signal. And I just like to add here as a caveat, like you wanna make sure you're in your window of tolerance here because it's we know now like it's not completely beneficial for everybody just to turn into their worst possible, to their worst possible experience. That's, that's no good, so don't do that. But you know, within reason, within your window of tolerance, you're, if you're able to encounter your own pain signals, and you're no longer running from them, you're no longer letting them drive behaviors like task switching and avoidance, although sometimes that can be beneficial. What essentially you might be doing is, and this is something we're interested in modeling, is you might be, um, well, you might be as a predictive system starting to care about understanding what those signals are all about. So now the predictive routine is, can you model that signal? That's kind of cool because if that's your task, then you can be succeeding at that task even when there's error in the system. So there's a bunch of errors in the body for whatever reason, like errors are being generated physiologically that feel like something. But now we have a sort of second order predictive task happening now, which is, well, how well can I get to know those signals? So you can have this weird thing. And that, that could go very well. Even, even You're still going to have the errors coming from the, from the nociception coming up there, but you're, you're, the errors coming from your emotional reaction to it and, and the things you do, those could really be minimized. That's kind of the second arrow, right? Something like right, that. Right, right. Second arrow, exactly. And you might even start getting rewarded because now you're doing better at knowing about your pain. Um, you know, and there is, I think for people who meditate, you know, for a little while, there is a weird switch that happens where you start getting really interested in your pain. It's one of the things that happen. I mean, probably not with serious chronic pain, well, maybe, but that's, you know, that's deep stuff. But um, at least, at least little aches and pains and bumping your toe and getting little headaches, it becomes really interesting stuff rather than it, it leading to a kind of feeling that, oh, I'm losing my predictive grip because I'm getting these air signals that are pervasive. Like I have migraines. And they can feel very hopeless when they're when they're on board, um, but when I started bringing those into my meditation practice, um, I started getting rewarded when I got migraines on the mat, because if I had a migraine, yeah, well, you're, you're way you're way into the you're way into the practice then. You know, well, yeah, but you know, like it's cool, it's cool. Like, what is a migraine? Like, what a trip! I mean, I only get one human life. Okay, I get one chance to feel what it's like from the inside to be a human. And for me, that has some migraine stuff. How cool actually to like figure out like, well, what is it like to have a migraine? So even though part of the system is going, get away, get away, get away, another part of my system started to emerge that was, um, that was actually rewarding me for like, wow, this is very interesting that this is happening. And you're right, it might not take away the first arrow, the pain itself might not go, but all the resistance that tends to compound that, that, that tends to like increase the kind of volatility of those signals, it does get washed away.
Okay, it sounds to me like you you kind of like to play with your pain a little bit. So we can get we can get into play right now. You got a great paper on what play in predictive minds. It says yeah, we're, that's right. we're, we're attracted to certain types of surprise, certain types of errors, you know, probably for the reason that it keeps us updating, it keeps us uh, growing. We tend to be attracted to these complex situations that that cause errors when we're kids and we need to do the most updating. Yeah. We get old, we get a little bit rigid, we don't play as much, but uh, tell us a little bit about how we understand play in terms of this model. It's a great segue point because um, our most recent, you might think given this framework that what we want as animals is to have no error. You know, we're always trying to reduce prediction error. So it might feel like we want to have no error. Like what we want is to have no pain, but also we want to have no uncertainty, no surprise. What we'd really like is just to like be in a dark room, being fed intravenously, living in a sort of pod. That would be our ideal, uh, but it's not our ideal. You or know? to do the exact same workout every single day. Why don't we right. like to do that? Right, right, right. Well, it turns out that actually, um, and this comes right out of it comes right out of the maths actually that what we're not trying to have zero error, but we are error minimizing machines. Hidden in that is an assumption that we want to get error in order to resolve it. Like we like resolving errors. So now the big question we started to ask is, well, what are the good kinds of errors to resolve? Like what are good errors? We've called them um, in a paper with uh, Mark Anderson and um, Andreas Rupstraff, both at Aarhus University and Julian Kiverstein. Um, we started calling these consumable errors, digestible errors. So what this is, is um, we're looking, we're most attracted to those errors that are just outside of our skills and abilities. So if I was to ask you, so if I was to say, look, you feel good when you do better than expected at reducing error. And then I asked you, well, where are those errors going to be found? Those ones that you're going to be able to do better than expected at reducing. Um, I think the answer is pretty clear. They're not going to be way out at your edge, your far edge, where things don't make any sense at all. And they're not going to be way close where you have a perfect grip already because you're going to be too bored or you're going to be too excited. They're going to be in that Goldilocks zone just above your skills and abilities, just above your comfort. Yeah, you mentioned and, the playing the instrument and how you kind of got turned off because it was too hard. Maybe if you tried to play a song that was slightly, you know. Right, the... right, right, right. And that's exactly what that, what that pain should tell you. It should tell you you've gone outside of your Goldilocks zone, pull back, pull back. So We've been looking at playfulness in terms of being attracted to these optimal error reducing opportunities, sort of right at your edge. Um, and uh, as part of that work, um, we're pretty interested right now in horror movies. This is kind of cool working with Coltan Scrivener, which has been really great. He's, um, he's probably the biggest name right now in horror research. And um, I've got a trip planned next month to the Recreational Fear Lab in Denmark to um, set up an experiment where we're looking at this, like, how do we find those sweet spots using fun, scary, or safe, scary stimuli like horror movies? Um, horror movies are- Rough and tumble play. Yeah, that's the other thing, right? Uh, parkour, rock climbing, gymnastics. I mean, you're always pushing your edge. So you're finding these different ways that we go out and we meet volatility. Now, why would we want to do that? I mean, th this is another story, right? Why would a system that wants to get a really good predictive grip, why would it be attracted to volatility, even close volatility? I mean, why would that be the case? Because it's not just a, a ho-hum account. We're not just saying, oh, well, it just is the case. Like, there's got to be a reason why we're attracted to the right kind of volatility. And the answer is, it just turns out that in our kind of world that changes as much as our world tends to change, the best way for you to get a good predictive grip over your whole life not locally. So we're back to that again, right? Not just to get a good grip locally, because there, I mean, you sit in your closet. That is a good way to get a good grip locally, at least if you're stressed out. We do that sometimes. Sometimes I sit in the closet in order to get a better predictive grip. But if you want a good predictive grip over your whole life in this kind of planet where things change as drastically and as fast as they do, then it turns out that if you're the kind of thing that's attracted to getting bigger and bigger and better and optimizing and hanging out at your edge, you turn out to become the kind of error minimizing system that is most likely to adapt to a whole plethora of possible, uh, of possible different sort of shapes and ways that the world can be. So 
that's cool. And that means like, if you want to be good over the long term, you should spend time at your edge. Not so much time that you're out of your window of tolerance, but you should, you should love your edge and find your edge and sort of play at your edge. So all of those sports that take you to your edge, um, they have some, they have some positive things for us, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in kind of the simpler explanations of, you know, why do we play? Oh, we're training up skills that we reasonably expect to be using later. So the kids, kids engage in rough and tumble play because their DNA expects that someday they'll be tested with a real fight, which could cause right. some real errors. So you, you, know, right. you, you deal with the small ones now, so you'll be able to deal with the big ones later or something like Indeed. that. But it's, Indeed. but it's cool that you can also get to this through the, the predictive processing uh, framework. And that, and that yields some more insight too, even beyond those conventional understandings, right? I, and, and I'm kind of forgetting in your paper, but, but uh, r remind me that some of the things that you can learn about play about uh, from predictive processing that aren't available in these more conventional understandings of why we, we play. Right. Oh, we, um, how about we can, we, we create our own niches. We can create environments that which kind of throw some complexity at us. Exactly. So I, I just want to comment on your point there about it being cool looking at this through predictive processing. And I think it is because what we have is essentially a sort of first principles way of bringing about these conclusions. So these aren't necessarily new conclusions. I mean, we're reinterpreting them through the, through the lens of this framework, but we have, um, we have a, a reason to that comes right out of the maths to start thinking about play in this way as you know, being attracted to these volatile edges. Um, yeah, so one of the things that comes out in our paper is all of the ways, and I mean, it makes perfect sense since this is what humans do, but if you love error, if you love consumable error, then what do humans do? Well, we make a bunch of consumable error. Why not? You know, where we organize our worlds to feed us just the right amounts of errors. So we have a new paper um, just submitted on video games, where video games are a really good example of that, where video game designers who are successful are the ones who are able to feed just the right amount of volatility in the right amounts for different personality types, right? Some personalities, of course, are going to like to be um, for it to be harder to consume, you know, right. massacre games that are like terribly challenging, like um, Elden Ring is one of those, or really simple games. And um, we're a little bit interested also in the personality differences that are attracted to these because if you're overly stressed in your life and you have a lot of volatility at work and in your family, then games that reward you very easily, like Animal Crossing or something, are going to be especially attractive because they're going to give you a sense of reducing volatility in your environment in a way that's really expected and understandable and digestible. Um, yeah, I want to say something else too about play. Um, attracted to our edge. I don't know if I've got it anymore. Well, here, how about this? Here's something I'm kind of interested in that, you know, we, we play less and less and less as we get older. We do more exploration when we're young, we oh. do more exploitation when we get older. And, you know, it kind of makes sense. You know, it, it, you, you know, you get good at something, you build your model and it's, it's kind of working for you and you stick with it. And you don't want to get away from it because that's, uh, you know, it, it'll, it'll look, you know, in this pretty soon your errors are going to increase quite a bit, even maybe if in the long term they, they increase. And, you know, as you get older, the, the long term is growing shorter and shorter and shorter anyway. So you might as well exploit what you got. How do you, how do you keep on playing as you get older? How much should we? Yeah, I love that. And actually it, it jogged my memory of what I wanted to say before you had mentioned that play being this opportunity to develop skills and abilities. And that's certainly true. One of the things that we're most interested in that play, like playing at this edge does, is it doesn't only improve your specific local skill or ability, but it also improves a more global understanding of your own response to volatility. And that turns out to be super valuable. So for instance, if you go to a horror movie, one of the things you're gonna have happen is you're gonna have arousal bursts from the body Okay, the higher levels of the predictive model, yeah, the agent level stuff, it knows you're in a theater. So it's not panicking. But all the lower level hardwired stuff, that's like run away from ax murderers and don't get eaten by bears and blood is a bad thing. And um, all of them, they're gonna act. They're gonna act when they see those specific stimuli on the film. So what you're doing is you're getting a sort of safe container to have all of the sort of negative valence and arousal patterns turn on that you have when you're at your edge. 
And one of the cool things about the predictive system that we've shown is, it, like I said um, earlier in our talk today, it's all the time trying to learn about itself as well and its own processing and its own way of being in the world. And by having a safe environment to have um, these errors come up, the system is also learning about how it encounters and how it manages that kind of volatility comes up. So it's not only learning a skill like fighting, it's also learning what's it like to feel under threat or what is it like to have a bunch of errors come into the system. So Coltan Scrivener and team did a really cool experiment this year where they, um, they looked, I, I can't remember how many people, five, six, 700 people during COVID. And they found that people who were horror movie fans fared much better during COVID <laughs> than non-horror movie fans. And we've been thinking about, well, why would that be the case? Because we know we've got some evidence for that, but we've been thinking why it's the case. And this gives us um, one nice framework for thinking about why that might be the case. Because they their systems have learned to um, predict well what it's like to be under duress. And so that duress rises and falls at a certain rate that they're comfortable with. And so there's not a lot of newsworthiness about it. They know what it's like to have a little bit of arousal and for that arousal to come down. They're sort of um, aficionados of fearful states. So fearful yeah. states lack that kind of surprise for them that ordinarily would be really caustic for everyone else. They're a little bit more used to having jump scares that fade, jump scares that fade. You know, you read something in the, in the newspaper, you get a sort of jump scare. And then of course the arousal system re-regulates and they're aficionados of this. And so they're very comfortable they're very comfortable with the jump scare or more comfortable with the jump scare. Pretty cool. Yeah, so that's, that's why people, you know, roller coasters are fun, but it's, but it's kind of like, we, it can make you feel kind of better for not just during the roller coaster, but afterwards. Cause now you've kind of, you've, you've uh, reminded yourself that you're capable of dealing with certain things and that's part of your right. self image. And that's why right. people do a tough mutter and it kind of like right. confident right. It's a, right. it's kind of like they've got a new model of themselves and their ability to deal with stress and everything. And, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, Mark, I've, I've taken, uh, we talked about an hour, we're up at an hour now. So I, I've, I've really enjoyed this uh, conversation. What did tell us uh, more about where we can find you? What were, uh, what, what you're up to? Yeah, nice. Um, I've got a website, a regularly updated website, markdmiller.live. Um, I keep all of my current projects and podcasts and you know, lots of interesting things we're doing with different labs um, on my website. So you can check out all of our stuff there. Um, I have a new podcast, um, the Contemplative Science Podcast, where we're inviting people who um, work at this overlap between contemplative programs like meditation and science, all the different sciences, psychology and neuroscience. And um, yeah, so that's been a lot of fun. And you can find us at thecontemplativescientists.com. And it's on everything. It's on, we have it on Apple and Google Play and um, we have a YouTube channel coming out this week. Um, yeah, and uh, oh, and um, if you're interested in this overlap and you're interested in this research, I would also recommend that you check out the new M3CS, uh, Monash's Center for Consciousness and Contemplative Studies, uh, which has just opened last month and it's huge and has such amazing, cool research coming out of it. And they're going to be running really interesting courses also at this overlap between contemplative research and, uh, and science. Well, thanks a ton for coming on. Everybody yeah. listen to the podcast, read the papers. There's just uh, tons of interesting stuff there. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Todd.